Thanks for being here for another live Action for Happiness event. My name is Mark Williamson, and today we're talking about mindset and relationships. We're going to be exploring this incredible expectation effect uh, that we have within us to shape our, not only our own physiology and responses, but also the world around us and how we connect to others. So I'm really excited about this topic um, and particularly excited to be connecting with our, our special guest today, David Robson, who's joining us. David, thanks so much for being here. Mm, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks uh, for inviting me and thanks for everyone for coming to listen to me uh, talk about my books. Yeah, thank you. And, and as you say, David, thanks to everyone who's here. It's lovely to see people joining from all around the world. If you're new to this, welcome to the Action for Happiness community. This is a movement of people trying to take action in their own lives and in their communities to try and build a happier and kinder way of living together. And if you're a regular, thanks for being here again. We're going to keep this kind and relevant in the chat. Please do support each other, uh, along with my colleagues behind the scenes, Sarah, and will be helping us navigate these topics and responding to what you have to bring. We'll be asking your views along the way and you'll have a chance also to put your questions to David, which we'll come to a bit later on. Um, as David mentioned, there are two books here we're gonna try and touch on in today's session. Uh, and then we'll say a bit more about both of them, The Expectation Effect um, and David's most recent book, which I'll let him introduce about uh, relationships. Uh, but David, why don't we start with a bit about you, you know, your own professional experience, but maybe also your personal story as to why these topics are so relevant to you and how they how we've got to this point. Mm, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a total combination of kind of professional and personal interest. Um, so, you know, I've been a science journalist now, a science writer for a, about 15 years. Um, and right from the start, I specialised in psychology and neuroscience and medicine. And, um, you know, you can't go for very long covering these beats without realising that there is a profound uh, connection between the mind and the body. And so we see that in every clinical trial that's conducted, you see that people who are receiving the placebo, the inert drug, you know, often do experience um, both the benefits and the side effects um, that you might expect from the real active chemical. So I'd always been fascinated by that particular element. And then, um, you know, through over the years, I just um, started building up, um, uh, you know, research in this area, which ultimately became my, my second book, The Expectation Effect. But um, more fundamentally, I just, you know, I'm someone who has um, dealt with, you know, mental health issues in my past. Um, you know, like everyone, I've also dealt with things like, um, you know, difficult relationships, um, problems with motivation, um, you know, and I've always wanted to look for evidence, um, evidence-based ways to overcome those challenges. And science really is the best lens for me to view all of life's challenges. So when I write my books, they're really, you know, me looking into the things that matter most to me and trying to solve those problems and trying to then spread the message of what I've learned to as many people as possible or making that message as informative and entertaining as I can. Mm. Well, we love the science of well-being and human flourishing in all of its guises, but also what we have in this community, David, is a lot of sort of lived experience and human wisdom. So I wonder if we might start before we dive into this and hear your expert perspective with just connecting with our community you touched on this sort of uh, what you call the expectation effect, but the placebo effect we've all heard of this idea that, you know, I guess you might think of it as the mind body connection that what we believe and what we think can shape our actual responses. And I wonder, I, I imagine our community have lots of experience of this. So maybe you'd like to take a moment in the chat to, to refer to a way in which you see your mental state and your physical health, perhaps connected, whether that's, you know, thinking about a food making your mouth water or whether that's other aspects about how you see brain and body connected. Maybe you'd just like to write a few words in the chat. I'll read a few of these out and then we'll turn to you, David, for some expert response. Um, how is your brain and your body connected? How have you seen that in your life? Um, over to you folks in the community. I'm just gonna have a look at the chat here. Uh, so yeah, pain makes me unhappy. I have emotional eating. Uh, going for a walk can change my state of mind. My stomach when I'm feeling anxious. Um, something I think about seasonal uh, light things, a feeling in my gut when I'm feeling a certain way. Um, yeah, and more about guts. Uh, being in the garden uh, makes me feel happy. Feeling sick makes me feel anxious. 
there's something about chronic pain coming up. Meditation can change my mood. Um, being anxious and stressed makes me more irritable. Um, yeah, so yeah, a sort of idea that your heart might feel different when you're in a certain emotional state. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can talk personally about back pain, which I think I saw as well, which is like I felt, you know, my, my stress coming out in physical ways around tension in back. I'm, I'm sure many of these and more are familiar to you, David. What are you what are you what's this bringing up for you when you see these sort of variety of examples? Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing that kind of connects all of them is that it's uh, two way traffic between the brain and the mind. So certainly your physical state of health can have a profound effect on your mental state of, of health. Um, uh, but, you know, it goes the other way too. And I think that's what I really wanted to explore in the expectation effect, um, is that our expectations can often create these self-fulfilling prophecies that can then, um, they can work through various mechanisms. The three main mechanisms are changes to our perception uh, of what's going on in our body. So we heard a few of those examples, but also then changes to our behavior, um, which can have an effect on your body too, you know, if it's making you more or less physically active, for example. But finally, and I think most mysteriously, is that our thoughts can actually shape our physiology. And now you mentioned one great example of that, which was that when you um, think of your favorite food, your mouth will start watering, you know, that is just one example of the mind-body connection. The your brain is actually triggering the start of the digestive process because we know that saliva has um, enzymes that can start to break down the starch in your food. Um, uh, you know, and we, so with the expectation effect, what I really wanted to kind of just explore was the, um, what's the limit of the mind-body connection there? And you mentioned the placebo effect earlier in medicine. Well, that's the most well-studied and famous um, example of this. But what I really did find was that actually um, placebo-like responses can influence the outcomes of all kinds of uh, things we might do for our well-being, whether that's the effects of the exercise we're taking, um, both the physical and the mental effects of the exercise we're taking, um, how we digest food, um, you know, uh, literally like how satisfied you feel from a meal and what nutrients you absorb uh, can be determined by what expectations you have of that food that you've just eaten, the um, outcomes of stress, even how long you live. There's um, a lot of research showing that your expectations of old age can actually shape your longevity. So, it's, uh, you know, the it's The feeling I profound. had when I listened to you now, but also when I read the book, is just like, this is actually mind-blowing in a way. So all these clinical studies that look at the placebo effect are generally testing out a drug or a treatment. And yet behind the scenes, the group that thinks they're getting it and aren't, are having these benefits that are not made up, they're real, and they're to do with what people expect and perceive and hope for and so on. And, and yet if we can harness that in some way in the way that we approach our lives and behave to each other, it's, it's an incredibly powerful, real effect. And that's why, so I, you mentioned exercise, and I don't know if, if this is one that you, you introduced me to first, but I remember reading, and maybe you can say more, about a study where people who were doing a physically active type work, like cleaning in a house, were, were introduced to the idea that being uh, doing that kind of work can actually bring benefits for their physical health. And actually they found as a result of changing the way they thought about their day-to-day -day work, got more physical benefits from their activity. Is, is that, am I on the right lines there? Is that that's an example? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's one of my favorite studies and it's actually one that I used um, to introduce my book. Um, mm -hmm. So this was by Alia Crum, who was then at Harvard University, she's now at Stanford University. But yeah, what she found was that, um, you know, given what we know about the placebo effect, she thought, well, there's people who are doing a lot of physical activity who might not see that as exercise. The, the meaning they attach to it isn't um, exercise that would be good for their bodies. And so she wondered if we change that by just giving them information about how much physical work they're actually doing in their day jobs, does that affect the physical outcomes and so like you said she recruited these um hotel cleaners and just gave them um you know scientifically verified like very objective information about how many calories they were burning by um you know hoovering the rooms vacuuming the rooms or you know cleaning the um uh, cleaning the bathroom changing the beds you know moving furniture <laughs> it's kind of like a, a form of weight training um so she she did that in um a few hotels in the other hotels, they were the control group. So she didn't um, give them that extra information, but she did visit them to record 
um, you know, their general health and well-being. And what she found was that after a month, this additional information that had changed the meaning attached to the work that they were doing had indeed uh, changed some important uh, physical outcomes, such as their blood pressure. They went from being on the verge of um, uh, having hypertension to uh, falling within the normal healthy range. They even lost a bit more weight. And it's kind of remarkable that just a change of mindset could do that. But, you know, this has been replicated in various ways to show that um, the effects of exercise and our, our physical responses to exercise really do depend on what we expect to get out of it. Mm. And, and so I guess thinking about the action implications of all this, and we'll talk about this throughout our conversation, I think, you know, whenever we are doing actions that involve physical movement, let's remind ourselves that even if we're not thinking of it as exercise, there's a there's a potential benefit for our wider well-being that comes from that. And just even drawing our attention to it can bring some of this expectation effect, as you call it. Would you define that particular one as a more that, about the perceptual change or the behavioral change or the physiological change? Because in some ways it feels like a mixture, doesn't it? Well, yeah, and we can't rule out that there was a behavioral change. And as um, Alia, you know, mentioned to me, that is itself profound because so the one potential hypothesis was that, you know, getting these people to feel better about their day jobs and like the exercise they're doing there might have encouraged them to do more exercise outside of work too. Um, and that would be incredible because it's, in, it's very difficult to get people to do more exercise. Um, actually, her, you know, questionnaires didn't suggest that was happening. Like the, the hotel cleaners didn't report doing any more exercise outside of work. So here it really did seem to be a direct physiological response. And that's not as crazy as we might think, because actually, you know, if you're kind of at the start of the trial, if you're feeling quite resentful of the work you're doing, it doesn't feel like something that's good for you. And then you change your uh, interpretation of that work. So you realise that it is actually um, having this benefit to your body, you know, that could do things like change your um, your stress responses just across the the day. You know, you might just feel um, a bit more positive about the work you're doing, and that can have a physiological effect on things like um, blood pressure. So, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is a pure physiological effect in this case. Mm. I, I heard someone say recently that I think it was because it was that recent research about how they'd mapped the brains of a fruit fly for the first time. But mm. they said the human brain is the most complex object in the known universe, which I thought was a pretty amazing thing to say, but sounds very much uh, plausible to me. And of course, we think of our brains in terms of our thoughts and all the kind of rational conscious stuff. But of course, our brains are also running these incredibly complicated physiological processes, whether it's our hormone system and our you know, the way that we manage uh, sort of our autonomic functions and things that keep us alive, but the way we respond to, you know, immune threats and all, all this stuff that's kind of below our consciousness. And so it makes complete sense that our beliefs about something that might happen could play a role in there in some way that we're not consciously aware of. Uh, is that how you think of this? That it's all part of the way in which the mind and body are trying to optimise our way of responding to the world, including what we think will happen next. Is that is that right? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly it. So the, um, and this isn't unique to humans, the fact that the brain is working as what neuroscientists call a prediction machine. Mm. So it's preempting um, what it's going to be about to perceive fundamentally. Um, and that is because actually the sensory data that we, um, that we receive from our eyes and our ears, you know, it's very poor, in fact. And so the brain is having to do a lot of... Um, uh, kind of patchwork to try to get it into a state that's actually meaningful and understandable. And, you know, that could just be, you know, working out where one object ends and another begins, but it's also things like, um, you know, the the kind of messiness when you're kind of on the road and it's misty and you're having to try to uh, work out what the landscape is around you. So the brain is drawing on its previous experiences and the context to build simulations. And it's constantly forming new simulations that it's updating with the information it's receiving, but also then the simulation is feeding back into the da data processing to actually kind of sculpt that data into, 
you know, it might fill in a gap here where it doesn't have good enough data and it might remove something that seems anom anomalous and probably isn't relevant there. You know, it's constantly crafting your sensory perception. Now that is, you know, we have very good evidence that that's happening from neuroanatomy and also from um, computer simulations of how we think the perceptual system works. But in addition to changing our perception, these simulations then are just helping to prepare the body for the challenges that we're going to face. And that is just an essential part of adaptive behavior. Like we couldn't, we couldn't even walk across the room if we weren't constantly simulating, you know, where our foot's going to land next and what, uh, how we have to shift our weight to be able to put the other foot down um, without falling over. So yeah, it's, it's a fundamentally really important. Analogy. I remember recently walking down a set of steps where I miscalculated where the last step was and and right. when i when i thought i was taking an extra step and wasn't or vice versa it completely threw my body's sense of where it was in the world even though it was only a relatively small change to my perception of the environment but it showed me how much i predicted what i was expecting to happen to my body but um i i wanted to draw us to something that i loved in your writing which was when we think of the placebo effect and those of us who've heard about it we tend to think of it as a almost like a fake effect or like people are being deceived in some way. But you also write about these, um, what I think called open label placebos, where you almost tell somebody this is a placebo, it's not the real thing. And yet still we get some of this effect. So what's that all about? Yeah, I mean, you literally can give people a jar um, that says uh, placebo pills take two a day. And um, there have been really good studies that have shown, for example, for people with chronic pain, that um, when you ask them to take these pills and you explain, this is fundamental, I think, you explain to them about the mind-body connection and you explain that actually when we're experiencing a placebo effect, the brain is actually releasing its own endogenous opioids. So it's actually releasing some of the chemicals that you know you would be receiving from your normal um, drugs with that knowledge um, and then performing the ritual of taking the pills people actually do experience a, a really serious and significant reduction in their symptoms despite not having the um, the active ingredient at all now that, that's uh, you know been shown in multiple studies uh, uh, the scientists are interested in how we can maximise those effects. So you can use a process called conditioning, where you might, um, first of all, introduce the placebo pills with the real drug, and then you uh, wean people off the drug. And through this process of conditioning, people will have an amplified placebo effect because of that. But in all these cases, people actually know what's happening. They've been The scientists or doctors have been completely honest, and yet they're still experiencing some of the benefits. Uh, an example I, I find in my own life of that, I'm not sure if I've got this quite right, but, you know, I sometimes have caffeinated coffee and then most days we'll have a decaf coffee. But to my brain, because I go through the same ritual of making it, like I still get the same sense of a wake up stimulant, even though I'm having a decaffeinated coffee because I my brain's associating it with the cup of coffee ritual. And so I feel like I'm I'm sort of giving myself an open placebo with a decaf coffee in the morning. Is that is that sort of along the right lines? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we can all put these kinds of things into practice. But I think also, you know, what fascinated me was that, um, you know, we don't even have to take a placebo pill at all to benefit from the mind-body connection. So there was a study in Germany that looked at people who were recovering from heart surgery. And they just compared the people who went through um, the kind of standard care, so, you know, perfectly good hospital care with people who were just given an additional um, four hours or four hourly sessions of psychological therapy, just a meeting with a health psychologist who could explain the, um, first of all, you know, what the surgery was doing so they could better understand, you know, the mechanics of why it was going to help the circulation. And then, um, and then just try to assuage some of their doubts or fears that they might have had about the uh, the surgery itself. You know, they would talk about what the kind of um, the recovery, what they were worried about, and they would set a plan for a kind of optimistic recovery plan for what they uh, would be able to do within the next six months. Now, what you found with that, you know, there's no deception there, no actual placebo pill, but they were experiencing quite a strong 
placebo-like response. So they left hospital a few days earlier, which was profound in itself, and then they were better able to return to work and to their normal activities more quickly. And this could be traced also to physiological changes such as uh, reduced inflammation in the body that might have retarded their um, their recovery. So you can see there that it's a again it's a combination of the change in mindset that then does seem to have an effect directly on the physiology that improves the recovery, and all just from talking to a psychologist. I really love this, and actually, what it's making me think and. Uh excuse me if I take a slight diversion here, but those who are familiar with the Action for Happiness community know that one of the things we do and one of the things I've been amazed at the popularity of is these monthly action calendars with daily actions. I mean, people, I'm just going to briefly share my screen here because we are in the middle of what we call optimistic October. I hope you can see this. Mm -hmm. It's a calendar. Every day has got a, a daily action you can take and they're in each one in and of itself isn't isn't necessarily life changing, but it's you know take a small step towards a goal that matters. Find something to be optimistic about. Recognize that you have a choice over what you do today, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think what I'm realizing hearing you talk, David, is that because what we're saying effectively to people is your small daily actions can shape your well being and have an effect. We're sort of tapping into that expectation effect that we're giving people a sense of agency and optimism and hope. In, in a broadest sense. Now, of course, you know, someone yeah. in a really difficult situation, that's not necessarily going to help them in that thing. We, we mustn't overstate this effect. But do you think that's right, that something like a, your daily actions can help is an example of a, of a positive use of the expectation effect? Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, I think one of the, um, one of the principles underlining the research I've looked at is that by learning about the mind-body connection, you are helping people to feel more empowered. And that can be beneficial in itself. Now we know with um when people are experiencing you know dis physical discomfort that anxiety can often uh amplify the pain signals. So there's this chemical called CCK that the brain produces when it's anxious that actually makes the um pain signals um transmit more easily to your brain and so that they can cause greater discomfort. Now I think often when you're looking at placebo uh, painkillers or you know any of these techniques that I've mentioned what you're doing is first of all you're helping the brain to release its um, own endogenous opioids so it's actually releasing its own painkillers but you're also simultaneously reducing the strength of those pain signals um, and, and helping to kind of turn down the volume on them at the same time so it's really mm. a combination of both and I think you know if we just think about mental health, you know, in the way that you were talking there, I think we're doing something, you're doing something very similar by making people feel empowered. It's helping them to appraise the, the stress of their lives in a different way. Mm, thank you. Uh, I want to bridge to something called the nocebo effect. And I want to do that through just sharing briefly. Some people will have heard me say this before, but I had a personal experience of very severe back pain. And it was turned out to be stress related rather than structural. I spent ages believing a story I was told, which was that I had a damaged spine and a hereditary disorder that meant I would be in a wheelchair by age 40 and, and all these sort of things. And I, I think actually with hindsight, that was triggering a sort of negative expectation effect, which is the story was my back is damaged, it's only gonna get worse. And I was feeling, every time I felt a little pain, it was getting worse and I got more and more worried and more anxious and I did less and less. And when eventually, thanks to my wife, who was training to be an osteopath and a book I read, I realized that actually it was a stress related condition. And my story shifted to actually, no, no, it's not permanent. And maybe actually, no, it's not as sore as it was. And maybe I, and I, and I got back from I can't get out of bed to I can run and play tennis again, which, which was life changing for me. But it feels like not only did I experience the placebo effect or the expectation effect in a positive way. For some time, I've been having a negative version of that, leaving me feeling really debilitated. It is the, I mean, what is the nocebo effect and is that an example of it? Yeah, so I mean, the nocebo effect is, you know, a negative placebo effect. It's like the placebo's um, evil twin, uh, right. some scientists call it. Um, and, you know, again, this can, you know, there can be the physiological changes. So if you're feeling, if you have negative expectations of pain, it is going to increase that uh, chemical CCK that will... Uh, you know, turn up the volume on any small uh, feelings of discomfort that you have. So it can, and that can uh, kind of escalate over time. So it becomes more and more painful. Um, and, you know, sometimes there can be absolutely no injury, but people can feel incredible agony. So one of my favourite examples from the British Medical Journal was that someone had um, 
they'd stood on a nail that had gone like right through their shoe and poked up on the other side. And this person was understandably in complete agony and pain. Anyway, when they got to the hospital, the doctors cut off the shoe expecting to see um, a, t- a horrific wound. And what they found was that actually the nail had just gone through in between their toes. There was no injury at all. And the, the guy recovered very quickly, obviously, once he had that realisation. Now, that is an extreme version. And I think in most cases, um, we there's no clear dividing line between the mental and the physical. So... You know, for most illnesses, you might have a there's a physical kind of trigger that is going to be causing your discomfort. And then there's this other component on top, which is the nocebo effect that you could, depending on your mindset, could become bigger or smaller um, in uh, changing the discomfort that you're feeling. But uh, what I really wanted to kind of uh, communicate to readers in the expectation effect is that it doesn't makes sense really for us to talk about pain being all in the head or all in the body. You know, in most cases, it's a combination of the two. And there should be no stigma, even if you are experiencing something that is completely psychogenic, as we would say. And I say that as someone who has experienced that. So I had, um, I was going for a difficult period, I started taking some antidepressants, and my doctor warned me that they could come with the risk of migraines. And I experienced really bad migraines. Um, But it just happened I was writing an article about the nocebo effect at the time that I was uh, receiving these pills. And so I I decided to just look at the evidence. You know, so I looked at those placebo controlled trials. And what I saw was that actually, people who were taking the inactive placebo pill also often um, experienced migraines as a result of the warning. And so a bit like the guy who had his shoe cut off and the nail was going through Uh, the middle of his toes, you know, I discovered this and within a few hours, my headaches had completely gone and I could return to normal life. Um, And the pain that I experienced was in no way less than any other headache I've ever had in my life. You know, it was not imagined. It was a very real headache. And that's what I want to communicate with the expectation effect is that even if someone had looked at what was going on in my brain, if they'd looked at things like the Uh, vasculature of my blood cells, they probably would have seen that there was some kind of physical effect happening in my brain. But it was just triggered by my thoughts and expectations. It wasn't triggered by the pills themselves. And this blew my mind when I found it out. I mean, I come from a rational science background as an engineer. I was convinced my back pain was structural. I'd seen the bulging discs and all this story about damage. And it was constantly agony. And then, honestly, within weeks of this sort of awakening to this could just be stress related, it may not be a actually what you think it is and it, 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 I, I, it literally transformed the pain that had been unbelievably real like one of the most real things I've ever felt wasn't there anymore and it was like okay that doesn't mean it wasn't there but it, as you say pain isn't entirely physical um, and and in, in fact entirely mentally created pain is very real um, mm. and we've got to we've got to be able to talk openly about the, the pain of every aspect of the mind-body connection without any sense of stigma um it feels to me though that the stories we tell ourselves and indeed the care that we get from our physicians and from experts really matters because if you're given a hopeful story an empowering story um a story that sounds fake i mean information that's empowering and information that's helpful and supportive as opposed to the opposite that can be really life-changing is what is the implication of what you're saying isn't it Yeah, exactly. And that's what I love about the research on the expectation effect is that knowledge is power and it can really Mm. make a big difference. And so, again, we're not fooling people. Um, Actually, just learning the scientific facts like and, you know, I love that as a science writer, but actually just learning a bit more about how treatments work can actually um, uh, increase the benefit that people receive from it. And so one example of that is uh, people... um, we're going in, I think this study was conducted in New Zealand and people were going into the um, clinic to get um, uh, an iron uh, blood, uh, like an iron transfusion into the blood to um, uh, to increase their, um, uh, to, uh, to treat serious anemia. Um, so it was really, you know, these people had been suffering terrible fatigue and then they were getting this, um, uh, this treatment to help them to be able to absorb more oxygen into their blood. Now, all the researchers did was um, they explained the kind of chemistry behind that, so how it was helping. So what the 
um, the medication was doing to help them to have more energy in their day-to-day -day lives. And what they found was that it actually um, amplified the, the effects of the medication in the short term, but also in the long term as well. So it actually meant that the benefits were longer lasting. And we can see that even sometimes you go to the doctor and there's nothing that the doctor can do because, you know, the um, like a viral infection will often just, you know, run its course and, and they can't give you a drug to deal with like the common cold. But if a doctor is empathetic to you, so they kind of reassure you that you were right to come to get yourself checked out, and they tell you that, you know, you have this kind of positive prognosis that actually it will, um, the discomfort will disappear very soon, what you can see is that those people actually literally recover physically from the virus more quickly. Um, by about, I think the average in this study was recovery time was seven days without that and six days with that. So, you know, that's um, uh, about what's that like 12% um, improved recovery. And really they can measure this so with So when you go to the GP and they say, uh, it's understandable this is happening, it's viral, you'll be better soon. That isn't actually wasting either your time or the GP's time because that's actually a, contributes to the healing process in a way because it helps alleviate yeah. worries, it helps you, your body exactly. stay on a course towards self-healing. I think that's yeah. really interesting. You can see that as well with like our peoplehood. Um, this was a kind of, uh, it was a laboratory study, but they had um, kind of triggered a slight allergic reaction on people's skin. And in one case, the doctor or the uh, the kind of lab assistant gave them reassurance that that would disappear soon. With the others, they kind of just, you know, didn't really tell them what to expect. And what they found was that actually the itching and discomfort and even the size of the kind of small rash, um, all of that kind of uh, got better much more quickly. Um as a result of the positive information that they were giving the participants. That's amazing. That's a really brilliant example. Now, David, I could talk to you about this particular topic all day, and I'm sure more questions will come up later on, but I, you then went on to write a second book, which is very much related, but is on another favourite topic of ours here about relationships. It's called The Laws of Connection. And, I, and I, I want, I guess, it builds on the expectation effect, but looks at how we interact with each other. How would you like to introduce uh, where you went after the expectation effect? Yeah, I mean, I do see them as kind of companions. So the laws of connection, um, that looks at the uh, the ways that our uh, miscalibrated beliefs, I would say, so our expectations of relationships can impact the way we interact with other people. And so what I found was that we have lots of these biases that can act as psychological barriers to getting the authentic, meaningful relationships that we crave. And that could be with um, your colleagues, your friends, your family, strangers, you know, your romantic partner, all of these things. Um, now, uh, I kind of got into this because, you know, while researching the expectation effect and just in my journalism in general, I kept on coming across research showing that social connection is incredibly important for physical health. So it's actually one of the best predictors of mortality. It's as important as the food you eat or the exercise that you do. And that has been replicated um, hundreds of times. Um, but what, you know, all of the books that I could find on social connection, on the importance of social connection, what they didn't have was like good evidence-based advice on how to actually get that social connection that we crave. And we know lots of people feel lonely for you know a significant part of their lives even if it's not every single day um so clearly we're not quite getting the connection that we crave and i wanted to know what we could do to 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 do that to actually to to find those relationships that would um that would be good for our health whether that's physical or mental so what what are the what are the beliefs we have about our interactions with others that trip us up and what's I, I got the sense when I was talking to you about this that there were things that are going on in both of our heads when we're with someone else that that um if we could only shift them slightly would fundamentally change how well we connect with others do you want to say a bit more uh, about that? yeah so I would say these um psychological barriers that I talk about are often um these kind of pessimistic expectations um so for example you know, you can get people to kind of just, uh, you can try to force people to talk to a stranger and you ask them beforehand, you know, what is this experience going to be like? And most people think it's going to be awkward. They're not going to enjoy it. Um, 
you know, they think the other person's not going to enjoy it as well. They just, you know, think it's going to be pretty terrible. Um, and then you uh, interview both parties afterwards and you find that actually those expectations were just way too pessimistic. Like the conversation wasn't awkward. Both sides actually enjoyed it. Both felt this kind of rapport. And you can do that in the unlikely, unlikeliest of um, uh, scenarios. So you can do that, you know, on the public transport, even on the London Underground, which is meant to be a notoriously unfriendly place. But you know, even there, people were really welcoming. They really enjoyed just um, a few words of, of small talk uh, on their morning commute. Um, and you call this, the, is this the liking gap? Is that how you refer to it? Yeah, so I mean, this is one side, but I'd say the liking gap then also concerns those doubts that creep in after we've kind of had that rapport. So, you know, we, we can agree that we've enjoyed the conversation you know we we were pleasantly surprised by how good that conversation was but the the problems arise then when we start um ruminating on our own skill within the conversation and what we often do is we um replay the kind of small faux pas that we made so even though we enjoyed it and we liked the other person we assume that we liked them more than they liked us we might we admire them, but we might think they saw us as being, you know, a bit of an idiot, essentially. And what the research shows is that that liking gap is just incredibly common. And so it's quite likely that in many conversations, both parties are feeling the same way. Each party is assuming that they liked the other person more than the other person liked them. And so that has immediate effects for your how you feel at the time, because you don't benefit from the, the social connection that you've just made. But it also discourages you from kind of connecting to that person again, because you you kind of feel too embarrassed to then suggest another meeting. So, I mean, and of course, you that becomes a self-fulfilling thing. And then the other person thinks, well, they obviously didn't like me because I didn't get back in touch. Yeah. So actually, right. if we can lean into this and actually be more conscious that, I, you know, I, I don't need to have this inner narrative about like, oh, they didn't like me. And I can continue to reach out to people and form connections. That will actually also help them overcome their liking gap. And you can build a strong connection that might otherwise have faded or, or not existed. Is that, is that right? Is, it, is there a sort of element of bravery that this encourages? Yeah, and I think, though, it's like for someone who's got quite an analytical mind, you know, I don't really respond well to hearing kind of just platitudes, but actually looking at the data and seeing that this is common, it did make me feel braver, but it actually just felt a lot less daunting to do that. I mean, you know, before I learned about this, I was always quite a shy person. And, you know, I'd have colleagues who would invite me you know, colleagues who I kind of barely knew, but they'd invite me like to a house party. And I would always turn down the invitation because I'd think like, they're probably just being polite. Like they don't really want, <laughs> don't really want me there. It might be super awkward if I turn up and they've just asked me um, just because they didn't want me to feel left out. And then you read like about the liking gap and it's just really obvious that that's, that's really unlikely to be the case. Like people, you know, we can take people at their word. Like people, if we just always try to, adjust for the liking gap and just think that, well, maybe people like us just a little bit more than we want. That can be incredibly liberating. Uh, another thing that I know you write about is the benefit that comes when we're all a bit more willing to reveal our true selves, take off that mask and perhaps, uh, I guess, I, I like to think of this as almost like be willing to have the conversations that matter. So get beyond the superficial of how are you, how are the kids, what's the weather, and actually share something a bit more intimate about yourself, a struggle, a, a hope, a dream. Uh, that that rather than being something that is a source of embarrassment or people sort of judge you for it, actually is an incredibly powerful way of building connection with others. Have I got that right? Yeah, I mean, so this is another percep perceptual gap in a way. So um, what you're talking about is self-disclosure, which yeah. is just revealing more of ourselves to other people, more of the things that really matter to us, the stuff we've been thinking and feeling. And we tend to assume that other people won't be interested, that they'll find it awkward if we start spilling our heart out. Um, and the, you know, it's a perceptual gap because that's not the case. People are more interested than we think. They care more about us than we think. Um, now, when you engage in self-disclosure, it can really accelerate the formation of a friendship. And we know that from an experiment called the fast friendship procedure that um, the control group just kind of answered conversational prompts with each other. They were in pairs. They spoke about, you know, what are you doing for Halloween? That kind of question that's it's perfectly fine, but it's not really um, telling you much about what's going on underneath, like um, in the depths of someone's soul. Um, the others spoke 
uh, about 36 conversational prompts that encouraged self-disclosure. And they tried to do it in a kind of left left field kind of way. So it could be like, um, uh, if you if all your family were safe and your house was burning down, what one item would you go back in to save? And that's really asking people to talk about something that um, has profound sentimental value. Or um, what topic of conversation is too serious to be joked about? And that's really getting someone to talk about their sacred values. Um, if you had a crystal ball, um, uh, what would you want it to tell you about your future, your life and your relationships? So that's really asking people about their priorities and potentially their fears and their dreams as well. So in each case, it's just pushing people to dig a bit deeper. And what they found was that after 45 minutes, so less than an hour, people had really enjoyed these conversations more than the small talk. But crucially, they felt a lot closer to those people. They actually, on one measure of um, social um uh, relationships and closeness, these new acquaintances actually scored better than they had done previously with some of their oldest friends. So it had really accelerated the formation of that intimacy between the two people. I love those example questions about the, the house and the um, the crystal ball and so on. I remember the first time I experienced something like this um, at a kind of, it was a sort of training related activity, but where we were, we were with people who we hardly knew and we were encouraged to answer these kind of questions. And I remember coming out of it with a real sort of sense of almost like electrified energy of like, I've just been talking about some stuff that really matters. And it was really, I mean, I totally agree that it formed a sense of connection, but it was almost like life suddenly becomes like an incredibly interesting soap opera that you're part of and is really real rather than all the fake nonsense that you might see and watch. And it was, like these people you had a perception of, suddenly you're like, oh gosh, they look really confident, but actually they're really struggling about this thing that's going on with their daughter that I had no idea about. Mm. But yeah, I feel a real connection to them. And I just think, it, I mean, we need to be, I think, careful about when we are in, embracing vulnerability. We need to have boundaries. We need to do that with people that you know we know are in the right state of mind to, to be in that kind of conversation. Right. And it needs to be a non-toxic relationship. But I just think that the power of what you're saying here, this idea of self-disclosure, as a way of deepening connection it's so important yeah i mean it really is and you know i think also what we have this tendency as human beings to um to come to like false interpretations of events so you know i when i'm going through kind of personal difficulties and i might seem kind of reserved or um you know like a it's clear that I'm distracted by something, it would be really easy for my friends to interpret that as kind of a lack of interest. Um, but by disclosing what's actually, you know, bothering me, um, I'm first of all showing trust in that friend that I can self-disclose um, without fear of, you know, repercussions. But also I'm just helping them to understand my behaviour. And essentially the more information that someone has to understand our behaviour, the more likely they are to you know to make allowances for those um, um and not come to the wrong conclusions about the way that we're acting mm. and bringing this back to your expectation effect point at the start that now we understand the evidence that shows that people probably like us more than we assume they do and also that when we share things about ourselves people will actually respond positively to, to it rather negatively that to be honest is a really helpful expectation layer to have in all of our human interactions really but you also talk about something called the gratitude gap and that's obviously a gratitude a theme that we have talked about a lot with action happiness but what is that and why why might it be important for us to express our gratitude to others mm, yeah i mean so it kind of sounds obvious doesn't it like you tell people what they mean to you um, but the scientific research again it, tell, it just shows us we don't do that um as often as we should and the primary reason seems to be, again, we don't trust our own social competency to do it. Um, we kind of think if we pay this kind of compliment or um, express thanks that we're actually going to seem quite, uh, you know, cringy and ingratiating. I don't know if there's any um, uh, Pride and Prejudice fans uh, listening, but, you know, we worry we'll look like Mr. Collins, who's always trying to come up with these compliments just to flatter the people that he thinks are most important. Um, now, the research shows, you know, if you're expressing gratitude or if you're complimenting someone and you're just genuine, genuinely thinking something positive and you tell them that, those people are not going to care really about how elegantly you express your compliment. What they really care about is just the warmth of the sentiment. Um, 
and you know it makes them feel better but it also can make you feel a lot better for saying it and there's a beautiful experiment where um uh researchers got uh students to get into pairs and to complete a project a bit like um shark tank you know that tv program in america or the dragon's den as we call it in the uk but you know where they had to come up with a new product and then present to a panel and what they found was that you know understandably people felt quite anxious when they were going to be judged for what they'd come up with but if just one member of the pair um expressed their gratitude to their partner um both of them showed a muted stress response and it all comes back down to just feeling in both cases that they had that kind of social support they had that social connection that would help to see them through the challenge i would love us before we come to q a because i know there's gonna be lots of questions and we're running out of time but i'd love us to just make our final interactive thing with the audience here an example of that so maybe i'd encourage everybody here myself included let's bring to mind somebody that we're feeling grateful to or that we are grateful to and someone specific a loved one a colleague a friend whoever come pops into your mind What's the one simple one sentence message of gratitude you'd like to say to them in, in whatever clumsy way it comes out? Um, if you'd like to share that in the chat, um, it'd be lovely to see some of them. But most importantly, having brought that to mind, uh, maybe just ping them a message tonight and or today, whatever it is, you know, this week. Um, if you'd love to share, I mean, I'd love to see a few examples in the chat. Like, Who are you grateful for? And what was the one sentence you'd say to them? Because I think, it, as David's reminding us, this is not only incredibly good for that relationship, it also gives that person a boost and gives us a boost. So I'm seeing Nancy say, my husband, you make life better. My sister, um, thank you for being my rock. We've been friends for such a long time. Thank you for making sure to help me with the practical things, for making my work easier. I'm grateful for my mother. Uh, thanks, mum, for the love and care. Uh, thank you to my partner for their consistency. These are beautiful to my husband uh to my you know my friend who's been taking me to hospital my parents they mean the world to me i'm feeling really touched just reading these and i don't know any of these people involved um so david even just seeing this has given me a sense of human connection if nothing else what about well, you? yeah and so i mean there's another kind of um psychological phenomenon that we call the witnessing effect and so that is you know, if you have a, a third party who's watching someone express gratitude to another person, what you find is that that third party ends up preferring both of those people. I mean, ends up liking those two people and wanting to form a social connection with them, even though they haven't been on the receiving end of the gratitude themselves. And that's um, there's this scientific theory of gratitude called the find, bind, remind theory of gratitude. And essentially, it's just, you know, gratitude... Um, has all kinds of functions, but one of them is just it shows how responsive someone is as a social partner. And so just seeing someone else express gratitude makes you feel more warmly towards them because you know that they're the kind of person who really appreciates the people who are closest to them. So you want to become their friend. And that's another benefit of showing gratitude to people is it actually just makes you much more likable to even the strangers around you. Who, it's a win-win-win. Win, win. It helps right. you, it helps the person, it yeah. helps everyone who's observed it. And it presumably encourages other people to do that. Exactly. Um, I'm really loving seeing all this gratitude appearing in the chat. Someone's even put their grateful to me. Thank, thank you for that. That's very sweet. Um, and what I would say is, as well as putting your questions in the Q&A for David, which we'll come to now, so please do add them and vote up. Please take those thoughts you just had and send them to the people yes. you're thinking of. Don't just post them here. Send it to your husband, your mum, your friend. They will really appreciate it. And you will love how that feels and the connection that builds. So mm -hmm. let's, as we leave here later on, let's make sure we do send these messages. Now, I'm going to come to some um, questions. Little Miss has asked, how can we change our negative thoughts and expectations and harness positive ones? I guess in some ways, how can we avoid getting caught in the nocebo effect and turn it into more of a placebo effect, if you like? Uh, or what, what, what are yeah. the practical ways of doing that? Because it feels to me that, um what's the right way of talking about it? Catastroph catastrophic thinking would be really unhelpful for all the things you talked about but really it is. shift right yeah so i mean i i do think like um uh so within the expectation effect i kind of try to give enough evidence for each expectation effect that just knowing that information can help you to reappraise different situations but i think underlying you know so many of these effects like you said is this process of catastrophic thinking 
And so one of the skills that we can learn is to, to spot that when it occurs. So to try to notice when you're descending into these um, thoughts that are very generalized. That's one um, sign that you're engaging in catastrophic thinking. And also when it becomes a chain of different um, thoughts, each one becoming worse and worse. So it might start with, you know, I'm feeling a little bit anxious about this job interview, which means I'm not going to get the job, which means I'm probably never going to find employment again, which means that my family are going to starve. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on like that. And you can notice when you're engaging in this downward spiral and try to challenge the veracity of each of those steps. Now, you don't have to be this kind of Pollyanna figure um, who's trying to tell yourself that everything's going to be fine all at once, but it's more keeping an open mind and just recognising that there, you know, there's a whole spectrum of possibilities out there. So you don't have to feel so confident in the worst possible scenario. And that's what we really find is that, you know, it's not about being super optimistic all the time. It's just about breaking that cycle of catastrophic thinking to the point where you can be a bit more open-minded, where you're open to reappraising and reinterpreting the situation. And just by doing that, you can have a lot of benefit. Mm, well said. And so this idea of a toxic positivity isn't helpful, like pretending things are oh. fine when they're not. But I love this idea we talk about quite a lot of realistic optimism. Mm. And in some ways, that might just be things probably won't be as bad as the worst case I'm imagining. And even that is a helpful way of getting out yeah. of one of those cycles. Thank you. Um, Coming back to the relational stuff, Sarah's asked a great question, which people have been voting on as well. When does self-disclosure, this idea of revealing ourselves, uh, become oversharing? Mm. So, I mean, that's definitely a worry, but I think most of us are so far away from that becoming a problem that we can afford to self-disclose quite a bit more than we already do. And I say that because there's um, a form of self-disclosure um, well, a phenomenon related to self-disclosure that's called the beautiful mess effect. And what this uh, research has shown us is that we um, are very wary about sharing our vulnerabilities, partly because we are worried about oversharing. So we don't talk about the, you know, failure at work that we might have had, an embarrassment, you know, um, a family situation, because we we're worried that people will start to see us as this kind of very weak or negative person. Now, what the research shows is that actually exposing a bit of that kind of mess behind our polished veneer is actually seen as being a very positive thing. So people appreciate your honesty and they actually see it as a sign of courage to, to share those details. Um, now, I, I think you have to, you know, it's an art as well as a science. So I think we have to try to be aware of what another person is going through. You know, if someone's going through a divorce themselves and then you're like oversharing some very small anxiety from your work without without even asking them, you know, what they're going through, I think that's clearly not the kind of dynamic you want to create. Um, similarly, you know, you don't have to tell everyone about all of your kind of, um, you know, uh, the ins the gory details of your like medical procedures if you think that they're not going to appreciate that. But you can try to work out what people's um, limits are. You can actually just, you know, the best thing is just to ask them, like, am I sharing too much? And, you know, if chances are you're probably not, but I think just, you know, taking every now and uh, taking the opportunity every now and then to, uh, to check in with that other person, you know, is always a good thing too. Just before we leave that question, something you shared with me before, David, was that, uh, again, this may be a particularly British thing, uh, but often we're a bit wary of views and are the things we're most happy and proud of with others because we don't want to be boastful. And actually, I think your research shows that actually people don't tend to see that as bragging. They mm. actually like really love seeing your joy. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So, you know, it's the opposite of the beautiful mess effect in a way, but it's, you know, we hide our successes because we worry about seeming like we're bragging um, and we worry about other people's envy kind of getting the better of them. But it's actually seen, hiding success is actually seen as being quite paternalistic and potentially offensive because you're acting as if you, uh, you have so little regard for that other person that you think they're going to have this kind of toddler tantrum when they hear that you've got your promotion or you've got your, um, you're pleased about your new house. And what's what I found so optimistic about this research is that um, if people do feel envy, they might see it as benign envy. Um, so that is where 
they they might feel a tiny bit jealous, but they see it as a positive motivation. It kind of proves that this is possible for them. Um, but more fundamentally, they just they recognise that it's a sign of trust that you have opened up about something that matters to you, and they engage in an emotion called confelicity, which is the vicarious joy at someone else's happiness. And you know, it's a beautiful thing, and it's much more common than we realise. Vicarious joy in someone else's happiness. What was that called again? Con um, con con felicity. Con yeah. Oh, con felicity with yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, Chandra has asked a really lovely question, and I actually really like en ending with this kind of thought, which is: this is all well and good for ourselves, but obviously this is also something we would like to bring into the world for others we care about. Chandra's question is: how can we coach others into choosing to take the first steps of creating sort of optimistic thoughts? or maybe to bring your expectation effect into their lives. Mm, yeah, I mean, so there's um, research showing that often like these mindset effects are actually contagious. So if you have one person with a positive mindset towards stress, for example, which we haven't touched on, but it's, you know, very similar to the other expectation effects, you know, actually other people start to kind of notice the benefits and they hear what they're saying and then they develop the same mindset too. So we can lead by example. Um, there's also this phenomenon called the saying is believing effect. And I love this because um, in a lot of these studies to get people to really absorb the positive mindsets, the researchers ask them to write a social media post uh, where they just explain, say, what the positive benefits of stress can be and then how they would explain that to one of their friends or, you know, to their social media followers. And what you find with that is that actually that helps people to by expressing it themselves, that helps them to internalize the positive mindset. So they're more likely to benefit themselves. But obviously, by doing that, you're also spreading the message to other people too. So again, it's one of these win-win situations. Just by introducing these topics into conversation can be beneficial for us. And we're just helping to empower other people to, to put them to use too. I really love that. It's a really great action to come from this event, actually. So wherever we're going to be today, tomorrow, the rest of this week, let's all try and tell someone about what we've learned in this event, about the power of expectation, about how our beliefs and can change not only our physical health, but also our behaviour and, and how it can affect our relationships with others. And actually, even by just articulating one thing you remember from this event to someone else, you'll be helping them and also reinforcing it for yourself. That's a really nice takeaway. Um, David, um, we've run, we've run out of time and, um, I'm going to hand back to you in a moment for a final thought, but I wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who's been part of this for sharing on the chat for all the wonderful interaction for the great questions. I'm so sorry we haven't got to more of them. Um, we're going to send around tomorrow a link to the video of this talk so you can check back in on anything David shared and also links to both the, um, the laws of connection and the expectation effect. Um, so please do check them out. I mean, they're really powerful insights that David has done a lot of research digging on. So we don't have to, but we can actually know that this is not just wishful thinking. It really is something with substance that can change our lives and help others. So thank you all for being here. David, let me offer you the chance to wrap up and give us a final thought. Um, cool. I would just like to say thank you. You know, I'm kind of overwhelmed by how lovely the messages are in the chat. So, you know, that means a lot to me. Um, you've all been so engaged and you've had such interesting insights to share. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that. Uh, please do get in touch with me if you have any further questions. My website is davidrobson.me. I'm David A. Robson on Instagram. Um, you know, I do love hearing from people. Um, but yeah, you know, one final tip just to kind of take this into your lives is if you've got an old friend who you haven't been in touch with for a while and you kind of feel a bit awkward about sending them that message, just please do go ahead and get in touch. The research shows this is just one of those perception, uh, perception gaps that I spoke about where we're too pessimistic, but actually we appreciate the making the contact the other person's going to be really pleased to hear from you. And it's such an easy way to just improve um, and give yourself a, this kind of boost in social connection that's only, you know, five minutes away. Wherever you are, you can do it. A lovely thought to end on. Thank you, David. You've definitely boosted our sense of positive expectations and a sense of connection here as this community. Thank you, everyone, for being here. David, keep up the inspiring work. We'll be looking forward to spreading the word more about your, your writing and uh, hopefully we'll be able to carry on this conversation in future as well. I would love that. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone.